Great. For everybody that's uh, joining us right on time or a little bit early, fantastic. Thank you so much for being so punctual. Uh, we'll, we'll leave it just a couple of minutes mm -hmm. because we've got uh, over 100 people that, uh, that that have registered to join. So I want to make sure everybody is able to uh, to join us from the very, very start. So thank you ever, for everybody else being so, uh, so tardy. But uh, yeah, we'll just leave it uh, a minute or so. It's OK. Thank you. Becca? Maybe just 30 more seconds. Obviously, I want to be punctual, though, because um, we have a fantastic session. I want to make sure we've got plenty of time for Q&A at the end. Ah. For anybody that is, that, that is joining us, if you can just put yourselves on mute, that would be lovely. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> Okay, well, I think people are obviously still going to be joining during the uh, the early part, but obviously I'm wanting to make sure that we have plenty of time, so maybe we'll we uh, we'll get started. So good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today on our wonderful webinar, our exciting webinar on the tech revolution and the future of work. For those of you who maybe I have not yet met, my name is Paul Wright, and I'm the Chief Commercial Officer uh, for the Australian British Chamber of Commerce. Um, I would first like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we meet today. As I'm based here in Sydney, that would be the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. So as I say, thank you. Welcome, welcome, welcome to this wonderful webinar. We're very excited about this. It comes at a very opportune time, uh, as we just actually held a large AI summit uh, last week, which I think actually a number of you were, uh, were attendants at. And and in fact, a, a few of you spoke at, like Aid, for instance. So uh, it's wonderful to see you all back. Um, we're delighted to partner with our longstanding chamber members and our fantastic partners over at BSI Group. Uh, I'm sure that many of you already know who BSI is, are, sorry. Uh, but for any of you who maybe don't, I'll give you a, a brief background about BSI. So BSI is your business improvement partner. Uh, they've shaped best practice for over 100 years, helping organizations grow the world, grow around the world, um, embedded excellence. Um, build competence and capability for sustainable growth. A purpose-led organization, BSI exists to have a positive impact on society. Uh, they partner with clients and stakeholders to deliver solutions to society's biggest challenges. Ultimately, BSI help businesses and society thrive together, accelerating towards a progress, um, uh, towards a fair uh, society and sustainable world. Um, they've assisted so many of our chain members. They've been an absolutely wonderful partner over many, many years. Uh, so we're delighted to have them today. Uh, and in fact, very, very delighted to have uh, Dushant uh, Sanathara, who is the head of Digital Trust APAC at BSI Group, uh, to give us an opening keynote today on how AI is becoming integral to the future of work, providing a constructive insight into how all stakeholders can feel they are participating in the AI revolution and how confidence can be built uh, in the context of business and the ecosystems in which they operate. And I'm sure that we have such a, a wide variety of different companies on this call today and different people on this call, which is wonderful. AI is obviously at the forefront of a lot of people's minds. I think it's affecting us all personally or, or commercially in, in so many different ways. So it's absolutely fantastic to have Deshant and our speakers to, to unravel this all for us. So following uh, Deshant's uh, wonderful keynote, we will be having a uh, informative and engaging panel discussion with two more outstanding experts in the industry. Uh, that is Dr. Alea Wirth, uh, who's the leading partner for Trustworthy AI at Deloitte, uh, and the wonderful Aid Ewart, who's the managing director of Aptico Australia. Now, this really is a fantastic opportunity for you, our audience, to obviously hear from these leaders in the industry, but also 
to really ask those those great questions, pick their brains and, and really have some great conversations as well. I want to make sure that this is as interactive as possible. So after uh, Deshant's presentation and um, obviously when we have our panel together, would love for you to ask questions, but also to utilize the chat box that's available here uh, to obviously ask any comments, ask any questions or put comments inside there as well. Um, so first of all, please allow me to, to introduce Deshant to give us our, our keynote. Uh, Deshant is, as I say, the head of Digital Trust Asia Pacific at BSI Group. Deshant plays a pivotal role at BSI Group, steering the growth, the growth strategy for digital trust solutions in the Asia Pacific region. His expertise in technology and business management, along with his deep understanding of the standards industry, grants him a distinctive insight into governance, risk and compliance. Renowned for crafting innovative solutions with significant impact, Deshant's leadership has been instrumental uh, in, in positioning BSI Group as a reliable uh, ally for businesses tackling the intricate challenges of cybersecurity. His efforts have fortified BSI's reputation, empowering organizations to approach the digital security terrain with assurance. So that's why you can see that he's going to be our keynote today. He's very well versed in all of this. So Deshant, I will now pass it over to yourself, sir, to give us a great 15 minute um, keynote before we uh, we open it up with a with a wonderful panel discussion. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to Shan. Thanks, Paul. Um, please uh, let me know when you're able to see the slides. I think, uh, um, does it work? Can you guys see? Perfect. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm going to touch on uh, trust in AI and a recent uh, survey or a re piece of research that we did over a span of last 12 months. Uh, wouldn't delve into what BSI is because Paul's definitely given a wonderful introduction to who we are. I just want to say that whatever we do, we aim to make sure that we create an impact for a, a fair society and a sustainable world. And that's exactly what our mission is as well. Um, having talked about the mission, I think there are two fundamental areas that we focus on globally, A being uh, shaping a sustainable future and, and the second being, which is the key part of my work is around creating uh, an environment that has a digital ecosystem, which is trustworthy. We call it digital trust. Now, we know that there's a lot that's happened, especially post-COVID. Everyone's talking about uh, <clears throat> digital transformation, digital services, and adding a lot more risks and whatnot. But the reality is that we need to embrace uh, digital evolution. The ris risks that businesses have now are very different than what they were 15, 20 years ago. And digital risk is a key part of that. If you look at just a snapshot of what are the sectors and how do they interact, we see a lot of digital chaos. And digital trust is more about bringing the order to the chaos. When, when we talk about digital trust, I think AI has been at the forefront of discussion at least for past 12 months or maybe a bit more. Um, because it's reached every single household now, every single office, every single uh, employee's computers in form of chat GPT, I guess. And we thought that it'll be great to do uh, some piece of research that can we can feed it back to, to stakeholders, to clients and, and, and community. Uh, BSI did uh, an international AI maturity model. Uh, the idea was to try and understand what organizations see as uh, the confidence in adopting AI, how ready they are, the actions that they're already taking or planning to take, and what are the attitudes and expectations towards embracing AI. The parameters are, what we looked into was uh, investment. So it's in, as in how much uh, businesses are ready to invest or they're already investing. What does the adoption look like? And what, what do they see as a big impact? their appetite and confidence levels and in terms of AI and what does training look like for them. Having said that, we also want to try and see if AI can foster some form of innovation at the same time as being safe, ethical and responsible. What does internal and external communication look like from their perspective and how does this all fall under creating trustworthy AI? So these were the parameters of the, of the work that we've done. Now, Adoption of AI, it's definitely from the data, it is inconsistent. Uh, there's no doubt about it. The response, uh, the survey was done based on 900 and 
32 business leaders in seven markets and the markets are here. The, the, the best output that we got was from India at the top and UK and Japan uh, at the bottom in terms of how they perceive AI in terms of maturity on those parameters that I just touched on. If you look at the same data, but with a sector lens, it's it's starkingly different. You, life sciences and pharmaceuticals at the top end of 4.3, and yet our healthcare professionals are at the lower end of, of the perceived maturity level. Now, what are, what are these parameters and how did we come about, right? So there are two focus areas. First is what is the attitude towards AI and what are the actions that are being taken in terms of AI and that is graded on, on the score of one to five. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I think Paul will send out the, the detailed survey in terms of what the nitty gritties are, but I'll, I'll, I'll pretty much touch on some, some important analysis that came out of it. The first one being the business leaders do know that they need to invest in AI and 81% of them believe in it. Um, but on the other hand, over the past course of past 12 months, 78% of the business leaders have said that they trust AI a lot more than they did previously. And they also believe that there has to be a lot more focus on training to ensure that there is some form of uh, AI investment within the employees, stakeholders, as well as the wider society. So what does training mean for the businesses? As far as the engagement and adoption is concerned, we know it's happening at a pace. Uh, all of us have started using AI uh, in our daily lives, starting from Siri to Jet GPT. But the challenge is that it's not necessarily consistent across different sectors. And I'm not saying just in Australia, we're talking about across the globe. If you look at it from a risk perspective, I think in media, for example, in UK is far more risk averse. Right? So you see a natural inclination from the UK businesses to be erring on the caution. But on the other hand, if you look at US market, they have had the heritage of embracing innovation for a long, long time. And hence the scores reflect that. But when you, when you look at the divide between the industries, the healthcare is concerned about how it would impact the, on the jobs while the life science industry sees that as an opportunity to enhance their operations and productivity. Now, there is another angle to the business, which is more around the size of the organizations, okay? So we're talking about small businesses, mid-size and large. So small, what I mean by is one to 250, 250 to 999 is mid-size organization and anything more are the larger size of the organizations. Large organizations have shown a lot more maturity and are willing to use AI or look at AI as an opportunity accelerator. When we look at the mid-size organizations, although they understand they are on the caution, but they are showing far more maturity in terms of actions already taken. So I'm not talking about attitude, but actual work being done in terms of implementing or adoption of, of AI. As far as the opportunities are concerned, I think there are plenty. But the key one that, that I see from the size of the organization is around how can mid-size or large organization can partner with small businesses, businesses that are coming up with innovative ideas, and how can they work together to adopt and create a, a value chain across, across the, the entire uh, system? And what does the support and success look like as far as the AI is concerned? The second aspect is, that businesses understand that if they don't use AI or though they don't adopt AI tools, they may be at a competitive disadvantage. As far as the focus areas are concerned, there are, I think, two key things. Businesses are looking at large businesses, like one in two businesses looking at how do they improve productivity and efficiency at one end. And at the other end, they want to focus on enhancing customer experience or customer service. So that those are the key aspects that have emerged out of the, the, the data. Now, going forward, the challenge is how do business leaders balance between encouraging innovation at one end and adopt AI, obviously for those reasons, but on the other end, how do we reassure our employees that we are going to do it responsibly and that they will be part of the future and they will help us shape the AI future as well. So I think it's a, it's a fine line that needs to be, to be balanced. 
As far as the key takeaways are concerned, uh, there are four. The first one being thinking long term. So when we're looking at AI, it has to be looked at a wider business strategy rather than thinking of that as a bolt on and it's, it's uh, you know predominantly resides with the tech team or technology team and they are the ones who should be looking at AI and adopting AI and whatnot. I think the core is how does a C-suite look at AI, AI adoption from a wider business strategy perspective. The second is how are businesses and policy makers working together across borders? How do they collaborate? And they need to, but how do they do that? And in doing so, the goal is to ensure that we innovative, we do innovate, but safely and responsibly. And we need to ensure, and I think most, uh, most participants agreed that they need to look at international guide guidelines because they're extremely important for safe, ethical, and responsible development of AI. As far as the uh, last two factors are concerned, I think it's more focused around having an intention and how do we move from intention to focus? Because the data clearly suggests that there's a huge gulf between what business leaders are saying that their priorities are in instilling trust in AI and the actions, the extent to which they have actually taken actions. There isn't, so there, there we can see a clear, clear gap, not just in one sector, but I think a, a, a lots of different sectors. And same is the case in making sure you clearly, we clarify our priorities and ensure that there is a suitable progression or acceleration towards achieving and, and ensuring those priorities. And last but not the least, it's leading and inspiring. What I mean by that is setting a standard for an AI future where technology as a whole is a force of good. As far as BSI is concerned and the services are concerned, there are a number of things that we do, but I think the key area here is that uh, from, from our perspective, I, uh, the key focus is around algorithm auditing and data set testing, making sure that there are performance matrices that, that AI systems are claiming and we, we assure and give a, a letter to state that they meet those performance indicators, which gives uh, clarity and satisfaction to the customers, stakeholders, or the board, whoever those are. Uh, ensuring that the technical design assessments are being done in time. There is a suitable governance framework in form of 42001, which is the international standard for AI management, which got released on December of last year. Uh, and the last thing is around being a notified body. Notified bodies, uh, key role is to review and assure and approve AI systems, which are mandated by EU regulations in Europe. So that's something that we do as well. Last but not the least is the key focus is in ensuring that we need talent as far as AI is concerned. BSI is contributing by ensuring that there are relevant, suitable professional qualification skills being provided, whether it's to the management system standard or to any of the technical requirements that people need in their day-to-day -day lives for adopting and embracing AI. That's me. Thank you, Paul. And... Fantastic. Thank you so, so much to share. And now everybody can see why you're the keynote for this, you see. Uh, no, really, really informative. I can't believe that the UK is so far down uh, on that adoption list. That's uh, that's quite embarrassing. Hopefully they, they come further back. But Deshant, that was absolutely wonderful. Very, very difficult to obviously fit in so much information to such a short period of time, but obviously a great opportunity now for all of our attendees to start asking those questions and, and really picking your brain. So uh, before we get started, please allow me to introduce our other two spectacular uh, panelists who are going to take us through all of this and give us their wonderful insights. So first off, we have Dr. Alea Wirth. Uh, Dr. Alea is the lead partner for Trustworthy AI at Deloitte. Uh, Alea focuses on the safe and responsible use of AI and leads the Trustworthy AI service offering, working with Australia's largest institutions to achieve ethical, lawful, and technically robust AI and automation. Elia served as a special advisor to the RoboDebt Royal Commission on Trustworthy AI and Automation, uh, led the Deloitte response to the Department of Science, Industry and Resources on Safe and Responsible AI, leads Gen AI Trust and Regulation, and is working with the global Trustworthy AI leadership, seeking to provide consistency and coherency to the emerging international AI regulations and codes of practice. Yes, you know, wow, I mean, just a little job there, Alea. So that's absolutely <laughs> phenomenal. Now you absolutely can see why she's also 
on our, on our panel as well. So thank you so much, Dr. Alewa. Um, and our final panelist, uh, which I'm sure may not need much introduction to many people, he's been a, a long-standing member of ours as well, uh, is Mr. Aid Ewart. Aid is the Managing Director for Aptico Australia. Aid has over 35 years of experience in data-driven analytics, mainly supporting clients to understand the information they collect about their customers. His frequently, sorry, this frequently involves developing new method, method, methodologies, thank you, uh, which harness the ever-changing technical landscape they use to capture and leverage data. As technological development frequency outpaces legal governments, AID has also learned how to strike a common sense balance between what can be done and what should be done, specifically in the gray areas of legislation. So thank you so, so much, our wonderful panelists. Now, as I say to our wonderful audience that we have here today, we'd love for you to obviously start thinking of some questions. Please utilize the chat feature that, uh, that you can get at the bottom of your screen. But if you do have any questions, please, you can obviously raise your hand as well or just take yourself off mute and, and, uh, and ask me the question uh, straight off the bat. But maybe I will start. Now, Deshaun, as you say, we've had so much information there and uh, and obviously Aid and, uh, and Leah as well. I mean, so much to do and companies obviously want to catch up, but where do companies, where, where do we start from? What's what's the starting point in order to basically be able to start achieving this in AI for their uh, for their organizations? Okay, good question. I think that's a question it's that a small I... question to start us off, you know? <laughs> Yeah, that's true, small. True. but that's a question that we get asked uh, a lot of times, and I'm sure Elia and Aid would, would agree as well, as where do we start? And I think one of the key points what, which came out of the research as well, and, I, and I'm a strong believer of that, is to try and businesses to look back in terms of what their strategic priorities are, where and how they would want to move is the key focus area. Because AI is not another technology piece of tool that we bring into the business and say, okay, now what do we do with it, right? I think that's, to me, is the key. The strategic priorities need to be understood. Mm -hmm. And within those, what are what is the role of AI to that in, in helping or aiding that? Probably it's for performance, it's for custom service, whatever that looks like. And then looking back around, who are the individuals or who are the representatives from across the business, not just technology team, who are going to play pivotal role, what their roles and responsibilities are going to look like, and then looking at technology and implementation and whatnot. So I think key things are the nuts and bolts should be upfront rather mm -hmm. than worrying about what the technology could do for them in short period or long period of time. Yeah. Last but not the least, the reality is we will live in a world where in, in maybe not now, maybe in five years down the line, businesses will interact with more than one or two or three AI systems. Then how do they ensure that there is a governance in place where they are we are embracing innovation at one end, taking advantage of efficiencies and making sure that they are doing responsibly? So I think that's probably the best way to start. Oh, fantastic. And Aid and uh, and Leah. Um, do you want to go next? Yeah, right. Okay, right. So, um, I'll just give a bit a back, bit of background because then you'll understand where I'm coming from. So we're a, we're a so independent software developer, but we develop a what what in essence is quite a complex uh, my, uh, platform that allows organisations to run analytics across their customers. Uh, to understand um, uh, why they're making the purchasing decisions they do, and then they can use that information to then predict what likely purchasing decisions those people are going to make in the future, and then use that information to then, uh, you know, nudge them along a path to send uh, pertinent and relevant communications to them. Now, the reason I said that is because within our tool, as a software developer, one of the things that we're, we, we've got to do to be uh, stay ahead of the game is we've got to adopt AI uh, technologies and our, our platform already includes a lot of tech, uh, AI type technologies, uh, which you'll find in, in a lot of software products that, that you know organizations are using and sort of day in day out. So uh, there are two different forms of, of AI or two real different forms of AI. One is machine learning, which is sort of number crunching and just sort of takes you through a process. Uh, to to guide you through something that normally you 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 might struggle to do. So a, a data scientist, for example, when you're doing some sort of algorithms or mathematics, uh, there'll be a wizard or or some sort of uh, uh, element within it within your software products that allow you to do that. 
And then the other form, which is the one that everybody's more familiar with, is Gen AI, which is where you can um, you, know, you can enter a, a, a question and it'll, it'll return with some sort of context around uh, as an answer to, to that to that um, to the question you've asked it. Now, the reason I just said all that as well is because uh, long way around saying it, but Paul asked me to, to pad things out a little bit, <laughs> is, that, <laughs> is that I reckon a lot of people are already using AI. Uh, and I, I've actually got a quote from Steve Worrell, the MD of, uh, of Microsoft, who was at uh, that brilliant summit that you held last Tuesday. It was, it was awesome. Uh, but what, what he said is that on average, 75% of, of employees are already using AI. And uh, Australia is actually um, ahead of the field on that. Uh, where 84% of employees, Australian employees, are already using AI. So I think it's already out there. A lot of people are already using it, um, but it'll be, they'll just start using it more and more as, uh, as people become more aware of the risks associated with it. Mm. No, thanks, Ed. Amalia? Uh, I think, too, uh, you know, Deshant mentioned it uh, right up front, which is start with a plan. It's so easy to get distracted by the bright, shiny, sparkly, um, exciting new toys that are coming through um, in the AI space. Um, I spend a lot of time with um, boards and executive groups that are both excited and terrified um, at the same time of what um, AI uh, can provide, um, but often don't actually understand what it actually is. So <laughs> um, drank the Kool-Aid without necessarily understanding uh, what that is. So, and when you're talking about starting with a plan, it is making sure uh, that that plan is really identifying value pools um, for your AI systems within an organization. Again, to Deshan's point is ensuring that any investment um, in AI is aligned to supporting your organizational um, strategy and then breaking it down to have a really frank, fearless um, uh, self-contemplation of where AI can truly um, provide that value, where your organization is mature enough to actually um, uh, get that return um, on the value. Um, and then I saw one, a great question in there by Elizabeth, which is with regards to return on investment, making sure that you've got really strong, robust uh, metrics uh, to measure um, the value of AI um, that is being impl implemented to understand where it's being successful, where you're getting the value and where it's not. Yeah, no, Frank, because very quickly, Elia, obviously your your title, you know, lead partner for trustworthy AI, and I think that's a big part of it, trust. I think that's the biggest challenge maybe that people have, you know, because, you know, AI is relatively, you know, unregulated here in Australia. So trust is always going to be a big factor. People don't like what they don't know. And they think as soon as I start doing this, am I going to be hacked or, you know, are there going to be autonomous killer drones that are going to come down on me and things like that? How how are, what are your thoughts on obviously increasing that trust in, in AI, particularly for small to medium businesses? Uh, it's it's really funny that you ask that because, uh, yes, my title is Trustworthy AI. I focus on AI uh, risk and governance. Um, so my consulting colleagues thought, you know, they did much cooler stuff in the build of AI. So <laughs> they, um, you know, they were all about the sparkle and opportunity where I was kind of the, you know, you need to get your um, risk management and your governance frameworks in place. Um, and quite often they're like, oh, you know, don't bring the risk partner. She's just going to scare everyone. And it's, <laughs> you won't get to build cool things. Um, and that has really turned around um, in the last six months, which is as a real um, acknowledgement of trust um, and effective risk management being integral um, to uh, maturing uh, AI or just implementing AI within organizations is without that trust, without that you know, effective risk management and governance, and no one in their right mind, no executive board in their right mind is going to um, approve the move of an AI system, uh, you know, deploy that AI system to be focusing on customers, um, et cetera. So um, it's, it's whilst people have considered the trust and the governance or the risk and the governance to be the, the boring side of AI um, previously, it's absolutely integral um, to get that right. And you may have seen that today uh, the mandatory guidelines for high-risk um, AI systems uh, was released or the proposed um, mandatory guidelines for high-risk um, AI systems uh, was released. 
And it's really interesting if you if you actually look through those guidelines, and again, I'm the risk partner, so that's why people don't invite me to things. But um, if you actually look through those mandatory guidelines, it's these are things that should be in place for like all AI systems, not just high risk AI systems. And it's really you're looking through. It's essentially you know, get good, get your governance in place. Make sure you've got um, accountability, uh, clear lines of accountability. Make sure there's transparency. Um, you know, all of those things, which are just important integral for any kind of AI system within an organization, those are, um, those are being put forward, have been put forward in the mandatory guidelines today. No, great. Thank you so, so much. And, and I, yeah, I did want to go back to uh, Elizabeth Beecham. I want to partner with that, Elizabeth Beecham, with that, with Elizabeth's question, maybe, uh, Deshantz and, uh, and Aid. So as, as Elizabeth said there, you know, you know interesting views regarding businesses' realization of the ROI of investment in AI, which is such a difficult thing, you know, how can you put an ROI on it? Uh, and if this is contributing to the gap between intent and action. So yeah, Deshant, Aid. Yep, uh, I do agree that that does contribute towards intent and action, depending on the size of the organization. So I think, uh, I think for for a, for smaller businesses, you know, if it if it forms a substantial chunk of investment, it certainly would. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt about it. But I think there is another challenge that uh, a lot of individuals don't realize is, and I think there was a there's a report came out by AICD or someone which was last year or the year before, which talked about organizations wanting to employ AI, I mean, having AI systems had to deal invariably with four or five different vendors for a number of different things, mm -hmm. because there, there is no single vendor who can provide you everything that you want out of the box. That was one challenge. The second challenge itself is the, the amount of talent that we have is very limited. And I'm not just talking about talent in Australia or in New Zealand. I'm talking about globally, the amount of talent that is there. So if you combine everything else with the investment in question, with other challenges such as trust uh, worthy AI, how do we combine? And that's, I think, playing a key part into having an intention, wanting to do that, and how do you go about it? I think so. There, there's not just one uh, challenge. I think there are a few more than than those. Yeah. Right. Uh, yep. Yeah, so there's the, with regards to the realization of ROI. The um, my perspective of, of AI is that it allows you to do uh, automation a, a lot easier, a lot more effectively. Um, particularly when it comes to uh, you know um, mundane tasks and repetitive tasks. So from an automotive perspective, you can introduce an AI system or AI tool that will just uh, that will allow you to uh, allow a, an individual to uh, offset those those repetitive and mundane tasks so that the AI tool can do it. Now, of course, you've also got to get the balance between trust, which is uh, what Deshant was talking about, because how uh, how much do you actually trust that the tool is actually going to go and do that? Uh, you know, on, uh, even though it's a repetitive task. Uh, how 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 much are you going to trust that it actually going to complete that effectively? So, uh, although a, a lot of organisations are concerned, or a lot of people are concerned that uh, the AI tool sets are going to get rid of your jobs, it, I, I don't actually think that's the case at all. Because what you're going to find is that you still need a human overseer to make sure that it's actually doing the job properly. But the point is that the AI tool can do, uh, you know, like uh, with regards to the, the, the field that I work in is, is marketing. So when you're running marketing campaigns, um, you might have an individual who might only be able to set up maybe one, one or two marketing campaigns a week. But with an AI tool set, you can set up a lot more uh, uh, marketing, marketing campaigns. So you've got multiple marketing campaigns running at the same time. The AI bot can actually manage that and make sure that they're running effectively. But you still need to have that, that person still needs to be there to have oversight of whether those campaigns are running effectively, that they're running on time, uh, that they're actually hitting the right people and producing the right results. So although from an R ROI perspective, it means that you're, you're certainly making a lot of savings because that person suddenly becomes a lot more effective than they would do normally. Uh, but you, you just need to have, you definitely need to still need to be able to retain that person uh, to be able to just have oversight of what's going on. Mm. No, thanks very much, Ed. And, and thank you, Claire, for your wonderful question inside there as well. So obviously to, to all of our panelists, panelists uh, interesting understanding from the panelists, uh, any learnings from how to take employees on the journey with us, particularly those resistant to change, uh, what to do and what not to do. 
I um, had a really interesting example um, a couple of weeks ago, and it was um, how do we get, uh, it was in the health um, space, and it was with um, uh, nursing staff on trusting um, uh, a, a decision support tool for more effective um, uh, patient uh, care. And the way that it was posed um, to me was how, how do I get the staff to trust um, the AI? Mm. Um, and my first response, well, is, um, is the AI trustworthy? <laughs> like how have you actually assessed <laughs> uh, the AI for trustworthiness? So it's not about like kind of a, a marketing um, overview over the top of an AI. It needs to be fundamentally untrustworthy. So you need to be, ensure that you've built um, the AI so it is truly uh, trustworthy. Um, he also come bringing in the uh, the um, point of human centered design, which is and human centered design is really ensuring that AI is developed for the empowerment um, of individuals. So the empowerment um, of the humans that are interacting um, with the AI, and if that's truly um, done well, again, not as a marketing exercise um, around the outside of the AI, but if the um, AI has truly um, been built uh, with human-centered design to uh, promote and empower um, the humans that are interacting uh, with this, um, it's you're in a much better position um, to, um, to represent the reality of the AI, which is um, empowerment and support rather than as a threat um, for uh, jobs. Um, so, and this, well, while I said, uh, you know, uh, truly investing in the AI to make sure it is um, both uh, trustworthy and uh, human-centred, uh, not in just a marketing campaign, but then, of course, there is a lot of investment um, in uh, change management uh, around the delivery of um, AI systems. Ah, thanks, Leah. Any other comments from you, gentlemen? Yeah, so um, we deal with a lot of organisations that, uh, that develop content, you know, creative content for uh, for adverts, either you know through emails or uh, you know, well, anything that goes on broadsheets. And um, when AI first came out, or ChatGBT first came out, there was a lot of reticence amongst our clients about wanting to use that, uh, you know, those tool sets uh, because they, mainly because they thought it was going to take their jobs away. But what you what you then find out is, I mean, this the the, the Gen AI uses, uses something called a large language model, which is uh, is basically a, a big algorithm that goes off and it uh, it will uh, come back with a, an average type answer um, based on uh, on how it's been been taught, so that the model itself has to be taught um, how to how to answer a question based on how other people have answered the question before. And it does that by scale, uh, scaling through the, um, the, the World Wide Web to find information or through a, a closed environment to find, find the information it's going to use as a source for that. Now, um, I've, sorry, I forgot where I was going with that now. The... <laughs> Oh yeah, okay. So now, the, the, what what people then realised was as it was coming back with the answers for the content for their creative piece that it was it, it actually formed a good starting point. So it it gave them a nudge. You know, you get that creative blank when you're trying to think of an idea of where to start from, and uh, you know it it it's great from that perspective. It gives you a good starting point. But the the issue you're you're faced with right, with it when you're doing creative, particularly if you're using an open AI rather than a, uh, an AI that's using, working in a closed environment, is the open AI could be pulling information from anywhere on the web. You could be plagiarizing, it could be uh, bre you know, using breach of copyright. So from a, a creative perspective, those those individuals who are first of all reticent about wanting to use AI suddenly realize that they could actually use that as a means of you know, just sparking, you know, giving them that spark of, of where to start from. But then they write their own content over the top of it. So it was it was actually their content they were using, but they're just using AI as a, as a starting point for it. Mm. And, and it comes down to, again, it's, uh, you know, initially people will have will be uh, reticent about using an AI tool set, particularly Gen AI. Uh, but when they start to realize that it's not actually as good as 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 they thought it was to start off with, and that they're much better, then then they'll adopt it a lot uh, a lot quicker. Yeah, no, fantastic. Because following on from that, uh, Deshant, obviously we had uh, a great question there from Mark Willis saying, following on from Claire's question above, what are the key blockages to AI trust from the point of view of employees 
Uh, obviously, your presentation mentioned management's perception of AI. Um, do you have any data on employees' perception at all? No, the, I think the, the data doesn't have employees' perception, but it does have perception of the business leaders where they are they made. I, I think there was a point made around making sure how do they embrace innovation at one end and while balancing uh, employees at large. So it's their viewpoint to start with mm. in terms of what does the future look like with the business. So I think there is a concern there. There's no doubt about it because how do you ensure the concern? But there is no information or data on it. Having said that, as far as I'm concerned in my uh, own conversations with organizations taking up this journey, largely it has been, uh, <clears throat> it's a mixed bag. But I think there are two instances, especially the one from last year, that I can clearly see an organization wanting to implement AI within their business. Uh, and I'm talking about a global organization. One of the key issues or challenges that they had posed while implementing that was how would our employees perceive use of AI and whether they would trust it or not and use it. Mm. So I think that, and there was fundamentally in internal challenge rather than an external one because the AI would was only meant for internal uh, usage. And I think one of the exercise that they did, which I think is really relevant is rather than saying we want to use AI, I think there was a forum and a discussion around, well, these are the common challenges as far as business and business processes are concerned. How do you think we could work together to minimize these challenges? Right? Let's say turnaround time could be one. I'm not saying that was the issue there, but then how do they address? And I think in that process that they discussed and came up with saying that we fundamentally need efficiencies around these two or three areas. And that's how the discussion went through to what technology we could use and then AI systems came into picture. And gradually as part of that conversation that already got the buy-in from employees saying, this sounds like a good idea as long as we do it in the right manner. So that buy-in was important for them to roll it out and they do have that now and, and it's working fundamentally well. Yeah. So I think it's really important for us to understand who, which are the groups of individuals or teams that we should be bringing together rather than only thinking from a tech team perspective, right? So I, I think that's that's the way to go about it. No, great. Thanks so much. And, be, and Fred, sorry. Oh, sorry, go on. I was about to say, just to be a bit controversial, it's, um, it is, you know, we talk, and I, I've just done this myself, is talk about make sure your AI is trustworthy, um, et cetera. But um, it's also, you need your humans and your leaders to be having a real conversation like really being transparent and they need to be trustworthy and your uh, the employees need to trust the message that is coming um with regards to ai because you know to be and this is the controversial bit but to be frank is a lot of the conversation is around productivity and efficiency fantastic i've not seen one organization say okay with this productivity and efficiency gain um, we're going to reduce workers to a three-day or a four-day working week um, at current salary, that we're actually, that's where the productivity and efficiency gains are going to go, rather than reducing the headcount. Mm. So it is about, you know, when you're having these, uh, when you're having these discussions or leaders are having these discussions, um, there needs to be really um, uh, clear messaging. Uh, there needs to be clear um uh, you know, strategy. So what are you trying to achieve um, with your AI? If it is productivity and efficiency, what do you actually mean by that? And then having real conversations on the basis of it. Mm. No, absolutely. Because I know Fred Chilton, another one of our fantastic longstanding members, he's, I think you've, you've sort of answered it there. You know, how do we know the tool is trustworthy with human-centered design? Um, I think obviously, you know, Aliyah, you've, you've probably, you know, uh, given a great response there, but uh, Deshant and A didn't know if you had any add-ons for that. I think uh, from my perspective, there are tools available. Uh, there are tools that we use, uh, which we call, and I think I mentioned that in my uh, my presentation as well, towards the end is what you call it uh, data set testing and algorithm auditing. So that's 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 where an organization would come and say, these are our performance matrices, uh, which is when then they are evaluated against those performance matrices and to see the output, whether it's, it's doing what's supposed to do, not, and what does that look like. But it's only point in time, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that AI will learn on its own. So what does that look like in six months or a year could be slightly different. 
or the fundamental purpose of the AI system may have changed over the course of time as well. So at that point, they may have to do reevaluate that again. But there are tools available where it's possible to do that, to try and uh, have a starting point around what does that look like. And I think if you, you know, a lot of people who are using AI, and in fact, I, I spoke to someone a couple of weeks ago where they clearly said that we are using this uh, for, I think it was for breast scan, and they already knew what the error rate was. The error rate was close to 94 uh, to 5%. Four to five percent was the error rate. They knew exactly what the challenge was and mm. where and how they are going to improve moving forward. Mm. So I think those there are tools available where it's possible to understand how trustworthy it could look like. I doubt they'll always will be mathematically be hundred percent, but as long as you know what the error rates are and what does that look like, and in the process you're explaining to the user groups, whoever those are, whether they're internal employees, your stakeholders, or externally with customers. I think that that's going to be the key, being open and honest about them. Because I think, I mean, just, just to throw a question in, in, in here as well, everybody at the moment is going on about a skill shortage, I think across all industry sectors, you know, but I think, you know, this is such a specialized skill as well. You know, what, how is Australia right now from a, a skills development perspective? You know, is there a huge shortage in, in skilled labor in this particular sector right now? And what what is being done to to, you know, increase that? I think Australia is always going to be short on skill, skills because it's you know, it's relative, compared to you know um, most of the advanced technical countries. I mean, I'm thinking of America and across Europe, we've got such a much smaller population, so it's there's always going to be a skill shortage, whatever industry sector you're working in. I think I think uh, you know it'd just be my opinion. Mm. Um, when it comes to AI, it's such a it's such a fast moving beast there's so many new things you know it's constantly changing and evolving um it, i think it'd be really easy if if a new component to the tech evolves and that component evolves in australia then australia could start leading the field you know it's it just grows that quickly so it's um i was actually going to say depends to the last question but i'm going to say depends to your question as well you know really depends what's going on mm. uh, Shanta, do you want to jumping on that one or i think i covered it it's um yeah we've we'll have we've got a skill shortage we'll continue to have a skill shortage it's yeah. um i get asked quite often oh my child um is in secondary school <laughs> or going into university uh, what should they be studying what skills should they be developing uh to protect themselves going into um an ai uh, driven future um, and before uh, generative AI, so before large language uh, models, um, my, you know, I responded, you know, really focusing on those truly human traits like um, empathy and creativity. Um, however, <laughs> uh, with the increasing sophistication of um, LLMs and uh, generative AI, AI can do Oh, well, AI is now creating, it's writing, it's creating art, it's creating objects, it's um, creating content. Um, so uh, we've kind of, um, that's no longer um, the def uh, such a defining characteristic. And then from the um, empathy side, um, it's developing a very um, uh, plausible uh, demonstration um, or replication of um, empathy. And I don't know how many of you have spent a long time in telephone queues in con contact centres. <laughs> But um, I do believe that um, uh, the, my interactions with AI have somehow uh, or quite often been a more empathetic <laughs> than those experiences going through um, those centres. So it's um, um, I still believe that it is the uh, it is the truly um, human uh, characteristics that will uh, take us forward. But of course, as we head in more into that AI future, it is. AI risk management, <laughs> AI governance, AI regulation. That's the growing yeah. market in this space. Well, I mean, because obviously I'm conscious of time and uh, and I know that obviously, you know, we, we only have this until until five o'clock. So maybe I'd love to ask just one final question. I know that there are some other questions, unfortunately, we haven't been able to ask as yet. Uh, what we will be doing is obviously releasing uh, the contact details for our fantastic uh, panel here. So uh, to all of our attendees, so definitely please get in contact with them as well. But I did love the, uh, the 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 question that was on here from Amy, uh, which said, "What uh, what are the the uh, uh, predictions for the growth capability of AI over the next twelve months? You know, what do you see as the future of AI over the next twelve months? How do you see it evolving?" 
it's uh, just on an exponential um, uh, curve, uh, mm -hmm. upwards curve in terms of sophistication. It's every time you, you've got that Gartner hype cycle where every time I think that we're kind of coming over the peak and entering into the trough of disillusionment and um, <laughs> we're off that hype cycle because we've kind of bottomed out whatever um, the latest um, AI uh, offering is, something else comes out and we just head straight back up um, that curve um, again. Um, so, and in, especially in terms of the conversational um, AI, and it goes to my point before um, about replication of um, human interaction uh, and uh, empathy, um, that's really um, strongly growing as well. And the job? Yeah, I just don't know. Every every day we hear something new and new technology come in, you know, new uh, models come in, systems come in, working, not working, whatever those are. But that's happening every single day. And to be honest, I can't predict future as far as AI is concerned. If I say this is exactly what it'll look like in 12 months, I'll probably be wrong. Uh, but the reality is it's an exciting field. It's growing. Businesses are uh, looking at looking at it. And uh, we truly think, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I truly think that it it has a lot of opportunity for everyone, uh, whether they are part of the AI future or not. But I genuinely think it's going to take us to the next level as far as innovation is concerned. Mm. And eight? Uh, yeah, I'm in agreement. It's it's definitely on a, a huge growth curve. The um, I think the only thing that's going to hold it back is the fact that it consumes so much power. Yes. Uh, so to have the compute power to be able to, you know, you could you could create a tool that's going to be able to talk to you and do, you know, you could ask it a question, it'll ask you a question back. So where you're having a conversation to solve a problem with uh, with with your AI tool set. So ideally, that's the that's really where you want to go to. So rather than sitting there typing away, you actually ask it a question, and then it comes back and it says, well. There are two ways of doing that. Which way do you want to do it? And then you go and say, oh, I'll do it like do the first way rather than the second way. But the compute power that's going to require is just going to uh, is going to blow the data centers up at the moment. So it's uh, I think that that will be the restriction. I think the capabilities there. It's just it's the it's the power that to drive it that's going to be the problem. Yeah. yeah. And can I add something that you just mentioned because there's a parallel stuff that I've been working on, which is which is coming back to your point around data centers. Mm -hmm. It's it's a very right point, and we talk about sustainability, right? Uh, and the challenge that we are currently facing, and we are discussing with data center providers globally at the moment, is there are two fundamental issues. First is that all governments, and in Australia, state governments are wanting to have data centers within their premises. I mean, I'm, I mean, in New South Wales, in Victoria, forget in Australia, right? So that's first challenge. Now, on the other, and and when you look at other countries, there are countries who have issues with with electricity. Yes, one. But the second challenge is also with water. Mm -hmm. So, and you need this to power your data centers, which means with AI, I think that's definitely the next challenge, which is more on the sustainability front uh, than actually the tech for uh, tech front. So, I, 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 it's an it will be an interesting one, for sure. Yeah. that's a very good point, Aid. Mm. I mean, it's a it's a it's a scary it's a it's a wonderful. Uh, tool it's, it's it's something that we're all going to to live with and we're going to be doing a lot more with um and i think you know these are the conversations that start to be able to see you know how we can how we can move forward with this in the future and there's so much more we could talk about and we can go on for hours i can't believe that we've almost done this for an hour and it's just flying flying by like that but um i would like to take this opportunity to thank all of our attendees thank you so so much for for joining us uh thank you so much to our fantastic panel uh, i would just like to throw it over to to Deshant right now uh, just to give maybe some closing closing comments and closing statements from yourself, Deshaun. Thanks, Paul. I, I just want to say there's plenty of really, really good questions, good interactions. It is fantastic. I think the, uh, the discussion can, as you said, can go over and on and on. The, there are two or three things. AI is here to stay, uh, so it's not going anywhere. We will be embracing AI in our personal lives, in work lives, and we'll come across that. I think the key is how do we work with AI in 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 a in a responsible way, and we will be forming part of it, no matter where we are. And I think that's going to be important and interesting. So don't feel that you're not part. If you're not part of the tech team, don't feel you're not going to be working together and 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 forming AI uh, to the next level. That will be the case. And last but not the least, I think Ed mentioned human oversight, and so did Elia. 
it is going to be important. So it is definitely not going to replace us forever. We will be needed. It's just that our roles will change as the technology evolves. That's that's all I can say. But it's interesting future. At least next 12 months will be interesting. <laughs> and most importantly, you're not alone. So to, to utilize the wonderful uh, you know, uh, skills and resources of our, of our fantastic panelists here, uh, to ask those questions, to really see you know, what your businesses can be doing to achieve more um, in AI or just understanding how to actually start and harness AI for your business. I would I would definitely encourage you to reach out to our fantastic speaker. So um, it allows me now to uh, to close the proceedings. So thank you so, so, so much again to our wonderful partners at BSI for uh, for putting on this uh, this webinar today. Thank you so much, Deshant, for your fantastic insights. Thank you so much, Dr. Leo Worth. Thank you so much, Ed Ewart. Uh, it's been absolutely wonderful hearing your thoughts. As we say, we could have kept this going for so much longer. Uh, to all of our attendees, we will be sending out a post-event uh, email, which will feature us the contact details for uh, Deshan, uh, Alea, and Aid. So definitely, uh, I'm sure they'll be bombarded with emails now and, and LinkedIn requests, but a great opportunity to pick their brains further. Um, and uh, obviously, we'll, uh, sorry, Deshan, you've also obviously given us a fantastic uh, tool that we can obviously send out to everybody as well, uh, another document to, uh, to explain things a little bit further as well. So thank you so, so much again, everybody for attending. Thank you to our wonderful panelists. Uh, obviously, it'd be remiss of me not to give a quick plug to the Australian British Chamber of Commerce as well. We've got some fantastic events, you know, coming up for the rest of the year. Uh, in Sydney, our next one is our Sydney Summer Spritz. Please do join us. That wonderful networking to take place there. If you're not already a member of ours, my God, why aren't you? Uh, please get in contact with myself or my colleagues here at the Chamber to see how we can support you as well. But for now, just want to say thank you so, so much again to Deshan, our wonderful panelists. Thank you so much to our audience and look forward to seeing you all very, very soon. Have a wonderful evening ahead. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, thank Paul. You. Thanks, Alia. And cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Yep.